All right, everyone, welcome to video three. So in the first video, we talked about getting all of your equipment and your location set up. In the second video, we loaded a package of bees into your equipment. And now in the third video, we're ready for weekly hive checks. So I'm gonna talk you guys through everything you need to know to successfully get into your hives and um, do your weekly hive checks. These might be bi-weekly once you really get into the flow. Um, but you're gonna to wanna to be getting into your hives, especially as a new beekeeper, every seven to 10 days, weather permitting, um, so that you really get an understanding of how a colony builds and that life cycle that happens over the course of the whole season. So, a couple of things about getting into the hive. You always wanna know why you're going and what your objectives are. So I do this with the little post-it note system, my goals for this day. Every time I go into my colony, I have a post-it uh, in my bee pocket, my bee suit pocket, that reminds me, what am I going in for? I'm not just there to dink around. I'm not just there to disrupt the bees. What are the objectives I wanted to reach? So goals for today, I wanna check the brood pattern. So I wanna see, are my queens laying in a really nice pattern? Do I have good functioning queens? And I'll show you what that looks like. And then do they need a new box? So one of your biggest goals is to make sure your bees always have a nice amount of space. So when about seven of your frames have drawn comb, you're gonna to wanna to get another box on top. Bees move upward in nature and they do in the colony as well. So those are the two big goals for today. And also of course, to show you guys what the inside of a colony looks like. So a couple of things to consider when you're getting ready for your weekly hive checks. Things you need to focus on are the weather. You wanna choose a day that's relatively sunny, relatively warm, because it means all the foragers are out of the hive doing what they're doing. If it's really cold, rainy or drizzly or about to rain, you're going to become the main event. All the bees are in the hive, you're the main attraction, they're gonna know you're there. If it's a nice, reasonably sunny day, warm weather, they're just gonna keep doing what they're doing. Um, so really kind of think about the weather. Bees will fly anytime it's above 45 degrees. Um, under 45 degrees, they may come out of the colony, but their flight muscles will freeze up and they'll have to land and either crawl back in or they just won't make it. So any day that's above 45 is reasonable to be working your hives. So you have your list of objectives. You've got the right kind of weather. You're gonna notice when we go out to our colonies, we're always wearing our bee suits or very light colored clothing and we're always working our colonies from the back side. If you're coming from the front entrance, <laughs> they're gonna notice you. Anything in dark colors to a honeybee looks like a bear, and any bear that comes to the colony is gonna get attacked <laughs> very, very vigorously. So make sure you're wearing light colored clothing anytime you're in your apiary, um, and that you're always on the back side of your hives when you're working. This also helps the foragers because they're gonna continue to come in with nectar, with pollen, with propolis, water, and they're gonna hand it off at the front door, at that front entrance. If you're in the way, it just causes confusion and really disrupts the hive. If you're on the back side of the colony, then they're just gonna keep doing what they're doing. So you're slowing them down a little bit less, which is good for you and good for them. Um, so in just a minute, we're gonna get suited up and I'm gonna teach you guys how to light a smoker. I said in the first video, I want you to get a really great bee suit, but I want you to act like you're not wearing protection at all. I've seen a lot of people put on full protection and then they're bumping the colony and they're bashing things around and they're not at all afraid and it's a little bit careless. They're not very careful about watching their bees. So I want you to just put on a great suit so you're not afraid but then act like you're barehanded and can easily get stung. You're gonna notice it's not gonna be the most exciting YouTube of all time <laughs> because I have to move really slow. I have to be very cautious. I try to give bees time to wiggle around and get out of my way, so I'm crushing as few as possible. Um, some of it happens, it's unavoidable, especially this time of year when there's a lot of bees in the colony. But you're gonna wanna just really tone yourself down, move as gently and as slowly as possible to be as less of a disruption as you can. All right, and I also wanna talk a little bit about the types of bees you're gonna see in the, in the hive. It's just a little bit windy up on my site, and so I wanted to do this where it's really easy to hear me or easier. So inside a colony, there's three types of bees. There's the queen, there's only one. Uh, there's the worker bees, which is the females, the girl bees, they're about 90% of the colony. And then there's drones, which are the boy bees. Their job is to mate with queens. So some people kill drones 
in their colony, but I never do because my colonies have had to make many, many queens over the years. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, which we'll talk about in the next video. And you need to have a solid population of drones to make queens if you're ever needing one or if your colony ever decides they need to remake or make a queen. So inside the colony, you're gonna see today all of the bees doing a variety of different jobs. And these are based on age, kind of like with your kids, you give them chores based on how old they are. It's the same thing with the honeybee colony. When they're born, the bees are janitors first, so they're in charge of cleaning out the cells, um, cleaning things up, getting the cells ready for the queen to lay in them again. Then they become a nurse bee, and they're in charge of feeding the larva um, and keeping the whole brood chamber warm and making sure all the babies are sort of fed and incubating properly. Then um, there are a bunch of bees that are in charge of receiving and putting things away. So the foragers come in with nectar, water, whatever they've gathered, they hand them off to the house bees and the house bees tuck it away wherever it belongs. That's about two weeks of a, bee, of a bee's life, those jobs. From there, a bee's body begins making wax. Um, it's like some glands in their abdomen and you become a builder or construction bee. So you're in charge of making or repairing any of the comb cells that the colony is using, building up the new comb um, as the colony expands, and then capping over the baby bees when they're ready to start molting and pupating, and capping over any nectar that is dried down to honey and is ready to permanently store. So once that's done, you become a front guard, usually. Um, and so you're standing in the entrance, you're watching for predators, um, you might take a few orientation flights to know where the colony is located and you're in charge of guarding your front guard of the hive. Then from there you become a forager and that's the last stretch of your life. It's only two to three weeks in the summer, longer obviously in the winter when you're not flying, but that's about how long your wings hold out on you. From there, there are scout foragers who just go and find sources and come back to communicate to the colony about where the good flowers are, uh, the good nectar flow is. And then there's the actual foragers who get, you either get pollen, you get nectar, or you get water. Sometimes they say you might get both pollen and nectar, but usually it's just one. You're sort of semi-specialized as a bee. Within the colony, a couple other worker jobs. There's like the mortuary bees who are in charge of finding dead bees or grass or debris that comes into the hive and taking them out. And then there's this ring of bees around the queen that's called her attendants. Um, those are younger bees that are in charge of feeding the queen, moving her to the right location to lay eggs, grooming her, and just generally taking care of the queen. So I'm not sure how many of those functions we'll get to see today, um, but that's kind of the progression from being a very lower level house bee to an engineer bee who can produce wax to the front guard and forager bee. That's sort of the life cycle of a bee. So in a minute, I'm gonna take you up. We're gonna get a smoker lit and I'm gonna show you how to do hive inspection. Okay, the first step to doing your weekly hive checks is to light a smoker. It's considered best practice and a humane way to take care of bees to use a smoker every single time you go in your hives, even if it's something very minor. Um, every time you do a hive check after you load your bees into the colony. So you remember we used sugar water spray when we loaded our bees or put the bees in for the first time. Every other time that we go into our hives, we use smoke. In nature, honeybees only encounter smoke during a forest fire situation. And what it does is they have this response that they may need to vacate their home soon. So it's kind of this warning signal where they said, suddenly think, oh my gosh, we might have to leave soon. So what they do is they eat a ton of honey. And once they've got their big fat honey bellies, they're a little bit slower, their abdomen can't bend around to sting as easily, and it sort of just mellows the hive out. The other thing smoke does is it disrupts their lines of communication. So bees talk through scent, and so your front guard bees may send a signal that we're under attack when you come. So the smoke just disrupts their ability to communicate with the rest of the colony and for the, the rest of the colony to communicate with each other. So you kind of get them all 
stuffing themselves with honey and a little bit fat and lazy, plus they can't communicate. It just makes the whole experience way more relaxing for them and a lot more relaxing for you. So I want you to think light a smoker, but I also want you to realize what you're really doing is building a fire, a small contained fire. If you're just going for smoke, it's going to blow out by the time you actually get in there. What I do is I put a couple paper towels deep into my smokers. You could also crumple up paper. And then I put some very fine pine shavings. I just keep a big bale of uh, pine shavings in my bee shed. I grab a handful. And then on my way up, I usually find some small sticks, little pieces of wood. You can also use a few of your bigger, if you have wood chips in your landscaping. So you want a couple pieces of big stuff, but mostly the pine shavings and some little things. So, you're gonna light your paper toweling. I've kind of got a little opening down here. And that will then start lighting everything else. You can give it some little puffs. And I give this a minute to get going. You don't wanna see too much smoke at this point. What I'm waiting to see is flames coming up and out the top. So again, think build a fire. It's not smoke you're looking for at this point, it's fire. Once you have it really going and lit, then you know you're ready to go in. I tend to use this time to get my gloves on. Some people go over the top of their sleeves with gloves. I tend to go under, it's just a personal preference. And while you're waiting for your flames, you can check your fasten. And not all your zippers are fastened. You didn't forget anything getting suited up. puffs here and let it go another minute so you've got flames over the top now which means you're getting close and then whoop we don't want smoke at this point yet no flames there we go now we've got nice hot flames coming out the top here's the most critical piece the last step is to just find some fresh grass a little handful of cool grass fresh not dry and you stuff that down into the hole of your smoker. So then you've got a nice hot fire going here. You close up and you can even put your hand out and just make sure you've got a nice runner of cool smoke going. You'll then use this at the front entrance and over the top and I'll show you how in just a second as we check the hive. Okay, so we're here and we're ready for a hive check. I have already opened this hive up a little bit, but I'm going to give you the idea of how you use your smoke. So when we first come to a hive, like you see, I'm approaching from the back. I'm going to step to the front and I'm going to just smoke the entire front entrance. And like I told you before, this gives the guards a heads up. It's like knock, knock. Here we come. Then I'm going to lift my inner cover or outer cover, which I've already done. And I'm going to smoke this hole. And then I'm going to smoke under here and set it down and just let the bees have another minute. So again, we've already opened this colony up. They know we're here, <laughs> as you can tell. Give them another minute for the smoke to kind of drift down through the boxes. And then you're ready to lift your inner cover. Now, just a reminder, your forager bees that are coming in with honey and nectar can navigate and find their way home. Your house bees that are in the house, most of the bees in the colony that you're gonna experience, they can't navigate their way home. So when you pop things off, and you can see where I've already done this, there's bees crawling on the outside, you're gonna wanna lean things against the side of their own house so that any bees that come out can scent their way to the front door and climb back inside. Otherwise, they can't find their way if they start flying, other than just the scent. So I'm gonna give these bees some smoke. And you can see how they're eating up this honey. Like I told you, the smoke makes them eat. You can also see a big, fat, juicy larva that gets torn open in the process. Don't let this frighten you. Sometimes they lay eggs and rear some brood in between the frames and you may accidentally tear a little bit open. It's unfortunate, but kind of a normal part of the process. So I'm just smoking them out of my way gently, trying to get them to move a little bit. 
and I'm looking here to see which side has fewer bees. You'll notice kind of one side's usually stronger than another. So I'm gonna start pulling frames from this side because there are just fewer bees in this gap. Now, here's a beekeeper etiquette rule that I try to follow. They have built this house just how they want it. If I come in here and think I know better and start messing it around, they're just gonna undo what I've done or put it back how they want it. Honeybees have been in existence for between like 80 and 135 million years. I am gonna trust that ancient wisdom a lot more than my own silly human wisdom. So when I take things out to inspect them, gently pull this up. And a lot of times you gotta loosen a little bit on the other side. And all I'm trying to do, usually these outside frames are just honey. The two on the outside, they may have a little brood. I'm gonna pull very, very slowly and gently. Well, this one does have some brood or else honey that they put in. Oh no, they're loading it. So here you go. This is very close to the brood nest. So you can see on this frame, tilt. The darker patches are pollen, and they always put a little drop or two of honey over the top of the pollen to preserve it. So they're bringing in pollen. This is some capped honey. So these are just food reserves. Now, I pulled this out from this direction. I'm going to replace it exactly how I found it. I'm not gonna turn it around front to back. There's a little bit of brood on this side, but not much. So what I'm gonna do is set it down here. There's also stands that you can do this on. And I'm just gonna lean it against the colony in case any bees wanna come out. And then I'm gonna keep looking. Again, our goal on this colony is to check the brood pattern. Now we're towards the end of the season and this colony actually made themselves a new queen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that process um, later or in the next video. But I kinda check how she's doing this one up and show you this is what I would call a pretty typical it's a little bit unusual but pretty typical um, you can see some of these cells down here where they might make a queen someday they're called cup cells it's pretty standard for hives to have a few of these at the ready in case they need to make a new queen like these guys already have this is a queen cell that they used previously and they're tearing it down and then this is what capped brood looks like. You can see, this is a great example, um, these flatter areas right in here are capped worker bees. Oh, we got a yellow jacket coming in for some honey. <laughs> these raised pieces right here are capped drone cells. In general, I like to see a big, I think of it as a rainbow. There's a big rainbow of worker bees the outer edges should be pollen, like a ring of pollen, and a ring of capped honey, which you're seeing out here is a bunch of capped honey on the outer edges. So they have all the food reserves right here at the ready for these bees. Now, let's see. Kian, can you zoom in really tight right here? This is the main thing you're looking for. As a new beekeeper, you're trying to see these tiny white larvae. Let me know if I need to move it. There's little white larvae that are not capped yet. They're kind of big, fat, kind of C-shaped. Looks like a grub almost that you find in your garden soil. A little right here at the tip of my... It's very challenging to see. We'll let it come into focus here. I'll try to get you good light. Maybe. There you go. Right there. See those little grubs? They're white. Yep, there you go. Right in those cells here. If your eye moves out from here as a new beginning beekeeper, you're gonna find those grubs and then move outward to see if you can see eggs. I can't get the camera, unfortunately, to focus on that for you, but I'll try to send you an image of what the eggs look like. But as a new beekeeper, you're gonna look for cat brood, you're gonna look for larva, and then you're gonna come out to these edges to look potentially for eggs. This one actually is in the process of getting relayed by the queen, so I don't know that we'll find many. Then you can flip and look at the other side. Again, pretty decent. Um, I wouldn't call this a spectacular brood pattern. What you want to see from your queens, this is pretty good over here. If you ever need to move the bees, watch me. I'm gonna blow. 
and they gently scuttle aside so you can see what's going on. Again, this is what I would expect, a solid brood pattern. Almost every cell is laid. They use a couple cells for extra honey and a couple of cells for like air conditioning and heating and cooling <laughs> functions. So it's okay to see a few little bits. But in general, I would wanna see this just a little bit more filled in, but I think they're getting there as I can see the um, larva and eggs are laid all the way out to here. When you're looking for eggs too, one tip is to try to get the sunshine over your shoulder. So you can kind of bring it out like here. You wanna be cautious. The queen could be on this frame, right? And your goal is never crush the queen. I don't see her. There's not a lot of open laying mm -hmm. happening here. But if you get the sun over your shoulder, you should be able to look down and see the eggs or the progression from eggs on the outer edge to slightly older larva to bigger larva to capped larva. I'll give you just a second, see if you can see that with the light. Again, this is part of the reason why I say having mentorship is so helpful. We've got a yellow jacket who likes to be involved here. <laughs> And then Kim, will you just zoom up here? So again, as you can see on this frame, you've got your nurse bees who are feeding the larva. They visit about a thousand times a day to feed them and just make sure they're ready. And when they're ready to cap, then your construction bees come and put some wax over to seal them up so they can finish their pupation process. And now again, I'm putting it right back in the way I found it. You'll wanna find a habit. My left hand is always to the front. My right hand is always to the back. I do it the same way each time. So I always know exactly how I wanna put it back. I'm gonna show you just one more frame because it's kind of fun. <laughs> so you'll notice I put one frame on the ground to make enough room. Oh, here's a fun bee right here. She's got her pollen packet filled. Oh, she's coming up right here. See her right down there? Oh, she'll come up again. So you can see they've got pollen and they're packing it in. Her leg is full with the pollen packet full right there. <laughs> the yellow jacket. So again, as a new beekeeper, I never looked for the queen. I don't want to see her because it means I might increase my odds of crushing or killing her. Now this is a pretty good brood pattern that I would consider really successful. She's laid this entire thing full. The drones are to the outside. We've got a nice band of honey and pollen right around where they need to feed the bees. So this I would consider a pretty solid type brood pattern, a queen that's really well made it and is laying really well. What you don't want to see is like some worker brood over here, some drone brood over here, nothing or craziness in the center, and then another pocket on a different frame, another pocket of brood on another frame. You want to see them pushed together and very tight like this and that they have the food reserves they need to feed these bees and to incubate them so they grow up to be healthy and strong. And it's really normal to see your drone brood out on the edges also. So as long as I see larvae and eggs, I know that this colony has a laying queen and her pattern looks really successful to me or successful enough, I guess, to get through the season. A mated queen that's been made by this colony is going to be a little bit less than the brand new or a little less successful of a layer than the brand new ones sometimes that you get from the company. So I'm just getting this reorganized here very slowly. Hi. We're busy today. There's a lot of activity up here. also tell from opening some honey the, the smell has attracted some other bees from other colonies there's a little bit of robbing going on nothing that I'm super concerned about and that's pretty normal so very careful I'm gonna pop this back in carefully as I can
And then one really important thing that I like to look at, and I'll have you kind of shoot down on this can. I always wanna make sure I've got this space right here between the edge of the brood box and the first frame. And this space, they're gonna fill it with wax, of course, on this side where I haven't separated it, are roughly even. So you really don't want those frames, look at them attack this yellow jacket. And she's gone, <laughs> successful. Um, you wanna just snug them to the center. You don't want a lot of space in between or they're gonna bridge comb and stick the frames together and it's just kind of messy and not as effective. So now we're gonna smoke them down again so that we can get the lid on without hurting too many bees. Sometimes people will employ their brush right at this point you can see how you use the smoke to move the bees mm -hmm. and they'll usually take the queen down when you're first smoking they'll take her down into the lower boxes to keep her safe but I wouldn't rely on that I always want to trust that if I'm holding the frame it might have the queen on it not gonna look for her but I'm gonna be very gentle and slow moving with it to try to keep them as safe as I can all right then there will come a point where this is full. All of the frames have drawn comb. They are filled with bees. I've got bees in every seam here. So if you're seeing this on one of your colonies, it's time for a new box to add a box. Now this colony has already filled a third brood box. It's over here. And that's the point where then you put your queen excluder on. This one's filled with wax. <laughs> We're towards the end of the season here. Um, this is a special tool that keeps the babies in the bottom and keeps the queen from getting involved in the honey process. So you have just pure honey above. Otherwise, you're gonna have eggs, larvae, those little wormy larvae, and your honey all mixed together, which is yak. You can't extract that way, or you could, but it's not very attractive, uh, not very tasty. I wouldn't imagine. So when you're ready, then, and they've got three of these medium boxes or two deep boxes filled with brood, you're ready for what people call supering. That's when you put your queen excluder on, and then you part, start putting honey boxes on. Most people tend to do two honey boxes at a time because when the flowers come on, they can fill that wax in and start filling with honey in a week. They can fill two boxes uh, when the flow is really, really on. So your goal is to stay ahead of them so they always have enough room to advance as a colony. Bees tend to move up through the year. So there are some things you do at the end of fall to turn the colony a little bit around so they can continue to move upwards through the winter and have enough food stores. So that's a basic hive check. Our goal is to just check that the queen is present, that she's been remated, they made a new one, and she's got a decent laying pattern to get them through the season, which I'm really happy about. Um, and just to show you guys what a weekly hive check entails. Thanks.